Hey there, thanks for tuning in. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 344. And today, I'm joined by Senpai Ricky White. My name's Jeremy Lesniak, I'm your host, I'm the founder at Whistlekick, and I love the traditional martial arts so much, I made it my job. You can head on over to whistlekick.com, see everything that we offer, and if you use the podcast 15 code, you can get 15% off all of it. You can also find most of our products on Amazon with free prime shipping and some other cool stuff. We even we do some exclusive stuff on Amazon too. Depends. Depends on where we think it's going to sell better. But enough of that. Let's talk about today's show. A lot of the shows that we've been doing lately come from folks who listen to the show people in our own community. And Senpai White is one of those people. He reached out, we had a conversation, and we talked about his journey, his story, and how it's different. It is physically very different from the story that most of us have. I'm not going to spoil anything. I'll let it unfold as we have our conversation. But this is an inspiring man. This is a man who refuses to give up who refuses to let go of things because some stumbling blocks got in the way. I found it inspiring. I'm sure you'll find it inspiring. But on top of that, he's a good man. We had a great conversation, and I enjoyed my time. I hope you do too. Senpai White, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, thank you. It's always a pleasure to meet someone new right i mean we, we've never met nope and we've this is our first time even speaking in voice we've exchanged some emails but here we are we're here today we're here to talk about you and your journey and at the same time talk about how your journey is you know similar to everyone else's journey i think all too often we highlight the differences in martial arts and maybe that's because it's more interesting to find the differences because for most of us I'd say 80, 90% of what we do, it's really the same stuff. Yeah, mostly the same stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, going forward, you just call me Ricky. Um, I tend not to use Senpai unless I've got a belt on. So, um, Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, yeah, I'm very informal, so, so well, don't worry about that. I understand. I appreciate it. And now that I've welcomed you to the show, there's no need to even refer to you because we're the only ones talking. <laughs> That's very <laughs> like true. when you sit down across the table from someone, you don't generally use their name because That's... who else are you talking to? That's very true. That's very true. Bring it in, you know, and and I don't know that I've explained it on the show before, but you know, it it bears explaining once in a while. The reason that we use these titles is because those titles are important to some people, and I don't want anyone to stumble on the show, start listening, and say, "Ah, oh, you know." He just introduced this martial artist as Ricky. There we go. I did. I used it, right? See? So here, you know, hey, Ricky, welcome to the show. And, and someone say, you know what? They're not using any kind of respectful terms. I'm out. I'd, I'd rather that we err on the side of caution. You know, what I call kind of the lowest common denominator of offensiveness, right? Like you get right down there. Very few people are going to get offended if you refer to them by title, but there are far more people that will get offended if you call them by their first name. You know, some of that is the the set that their Facebook name includes their martial arts title. Some of those folks, for example. Well, I and uh, maybe that says more about them than than about the listeners. But um, uh, but I mean, if you're putting putting it in your in your Facebook profile, then the there may be other reasons for that, you know, obviously from a marketing point of view and, and those kind of things, but completely, yeah, that's, that's, that's more understandable, I think. But, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I just, I, I don't mean, want anybody to get offended. No. And you've had this conversation. I, I, I've been a, a long listener now for a while. So we, we've heard these conversations time and time again. So sometimes it gets blurry for me between when the, 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 the episode starts and then the stuff on the front and the back. You know, because we always chop stuff off and, and here we are, you know, you're, ep- I think you're scheduled to be episode 348. Yeah, 348. That's a lot of conversations. <laughs> That's a lot of conversations. <laughs> I try to keep it all straight, <laughs> but it's just getting harder and harder. There was a time in, in the first like 150 episodes, if you had given me a name, I could have told you what episode they were. 
Wow. I can't do that anymore. I can, I can wow. corral it. I can give you like a range of 20. But I can't, I can't tell you who's what anymore. It may, makes it more difficult, I suppose, because you probably record more than one person on a single day. You know? Often, so, so oftentimes, that, yeah, there will be two of you recording that, um, today. That, that merges everything together even more. So. Sure does. Cool. Let's talk about your journey through mm. the martial arts. You know, let's let's go back. When did you start? Um, that's a good question. I actually, I've kind of uh, been on two little journeys. I actually started martial arts when I was very young, um, but more. But I kind of left for about eighteen years, um, and then came back to it. So, um, going way back, I was probably around the age of seven um, when I first got into martial arts. Um, I was bullied a lot when I was younger, um, and particularly there was one incident where two um, brothers from down the street, um, they would never let me go down the street to the corner shop, uh, the store, to buy bread or milk or whatever I needed to to get. And um, they were younger than me as well. So when you're seven, eight years old, that's quite a big difference being bullied by someone who's a year or two younger than you. Mm. Um, So dad, my dad did Shotokan karate growing up. Um, so he says, let's sign him up for martial arts. He obviously needs a confidence and needs to, uh, do something about these bullies. Um, and so he took me along to, um, his old school and they actually wouldn't accept me because I wasn't quite old enough. Um, so I, I, I took a judo, a few judo classes, but I didn't get on with that. I actually have no idea why I didn't get on with that. I can't remember. All I remember is I never tested for a belt. I remember being there and doing a few simple judo moves, and that was it. I had a judo gi. That's all I remember. Um, so I didn't stick around for very long, and then I ended up going back when I was old enough to do Shotokan karate. Um, and I did that through, I went up to Almost Brown. Um, yeah. And so I did that for about five years. So I, um, I finished around 12, 13 years old. And I only finished because I was starting to lose interest because, you know, I was 13 years old. There was girls and roller skating was popular back then and uh, all these other kind of social activities. So um, it just kind of lost priority in my life. And I'd kind of got a lot of confidence out of it. Bullying was no longer an issue for me, even though I was pretty much bullied at some point throughout my whole school life. But it was never it never affected me as much because I always had this, this, this training, um, to defend myself. And and now this more, more confidence. So it it never lasted. Sure. Um, so it never became a priority in my life. So I stopped going and it wasn't until, um, I, so I'm originally from England and I moved to America, live in America in October of 2014. In March of 2015, I started, um, Shaolin Kempo Karate, uh, which is what I study now. Um, and um, although it's been a relatively short term by some people's measurements, um, not by mine, but by some, um, I, I've achieved black belt. Um, and we'll probably go into a little bit more of that later on. But um, that's kind of the, the whistle stop overview of it. Um, yeah, so that's, that's my basics in, okay. in background in, in martial arts. But so even that, even though, sorry, even though I've I kind of took this kind of eighteen nineteen year break, um, it wasn't until I started martial arts again that I realised I'd kind of always been practicing. Even though I wasn't punching and kicking things and um, doing the physical aspects of the training, I was always I was always trying to improve myself. I was always learning new things. I was always tweaking things about my own personality about the things I do I was I was very much um you know being I was doing everything you would expect a martial artist to do outside of the dojo and um that's never left me and it wasn't until I I got back into the dojo that I realized I've been practicing constantly I've just not been punching and kicking stuff so um so in one way I I never left but Mm. it's such an interesting notion that that you're talking about the idea that martial arts can be practiced without punching and kicking. And I think anyone who's trained for a while understands that. And anyone who is actively training understands that there 
training doesn't stop when you walk out of the, the dojo or the dojang or whatever you might call it. But this idea that you can stop actively training in a martial arts school for that long, but still be a martial artist. It's something that a lot of people will disagree with. I don't. I fully support what, what you're saying. I fully agree that you can remain a martial artist. It's a, a mindset. It's the way you look at the world. It's the way you conduct yourself. Absolutely. And, and it, it took my return to realize that that was what I was doing. I would never have called myself a martial artist at the time. Um, but maybe looking back, I probably could have. Mm. But Absolutely. That's the benefit of hindsight, right? Yeah. Now, what was it like going back in that first class after not training for 18 years? It was frustrating. It was frustrating. Um, so... Maybe now is a good time to take a little kind of aside to explain why I went back to martial arts sure, in the first sure. place because it kind of feeds it feeds into the question. So um, the reason we we kind of initially started talking to each other is because I wanted to talk about uh, disability in the martial arts. So I have a, a condition called ankylosing spondylitis. It's a form of arthritis. Um, there's actually over 200 forms of arthritis, and um, most of them don't affect old people like. Um, most people think they actually affect young people. Mm. Um, it's an inflammatory arthritis, so it's not a degeneration necessarily of the bone. It's um, caused by inflammation around the joints, um, where your ligaments meet, where your ligaments meet and your tendons meet. The bone is called the, the exact kind of point they meet is called anthesis. Um, and what happens in ankylosing spondylitis? which I'm just going to call AS from now on because it's just mm -hmm. too, lo too long, um, is that you get inflammation there. So if anyone's ever had kind of tendonitis or anything like that, knows how painful that can be, well, that's, that's me on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I have pain every single day. The last day I was pain-free was probably around not long after I got diagnosed, and I was diagnosed in March of 2010. Um, so it's been a good eight years without a day free of pain. Um, now, at, at points I've been, uh, I would have been classified as disabled. I was unable to walk. I can kick people in the head and my mobility is certainly I'm gonna much, jump in for much a second. better than, than that. Um, so one of the reasons I started is because exercise is shown to be beneficial with AS. Um, it actually improves your pain um, and it keeps the joints moving. If my joints stay, if I sit for too long or lie for too long, all my joints kind of seize up and, and, and then I get really, really stiff and it gets really difficult for me to keep move, move again. So actually exercise is, um, is a huge benefit. It's one of the ways that we treat it as well as all the um, pharmacological methods available. Mm. Um, so... When we moved to America, I'd already kind of let myself go in a little way. You know, my weight was higher than it should be, um, which affects my pain. Because obviously, if you're moving around more weight, then you're going to have more uh, more stress on your thing, on your on your joints, on your bones, on your spine. Um, and AS mainly affects the spine and the hips and uh, the sacroiliac joints, which are at the bottom of the spine. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually, I've already forwarded you to a, a video, which hopefully you'll include in the show notes. So if you want yes. to know more about where these positions are in the spine, I'm not going to give you a biology lecture now, but um, <laughs> you can just watch the video. It's a five minute video. So anyone listening can just go watch that. Sure. Um, so uh, I forgot my place. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, yes. So, so that's, so that's where I started. So, I'd let myself go a little bit before I moved, and obviously that was affecting my pain. Uh, so when you move country, you kind of lose you lose all your kind of social uh, aspects of life. You know, I had no friends apart from or anyone. Uh, I just had family that I lived with. So I needed a way of getting out the house. I needed a way of trying to lose weight, and I needed a way of exercising more. And um, it turns out that martial arts good for all three of those things. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so I, I rolled up to um, 
my local dojo. I had no idea what style they practiced at the time. I just turned up and um, I met with my sensei and um, he was very welcoming. I explained my disease and he says, we can work with that. And we did. Um, so it was very frustrating because uh, when I first started, now I'm actually going to answer your question. <laughs> when, I, when, when, I, when I first started, uh, I didn't realize how much I remembered. I expected to, to know nothing again, to be completely you know, a blank slate after all those years. But as I started practicing, it turns out I actually remembered pretty much all of it. So all the technique, all the, all, the, the, uh, all the knowledge was there. I just didn't have the physical ability. And that was incredibly frustrating. And when I look at, when I, I, I teach uh, white belts and yellow belts and uh, people just starting, they, they generally have more ability than they have knowledge. But I was the opposite way around, and that was incredibly frustrating. Um, so um, I, there was a bit of a mental hurdle to get over when I first started, but it kind of just made me more determined to just you know, nail it. Mm. I'd like to talk about that conversation you had with the instructor yeah. when you walked in. Now, now I want to, I'm going to go on my own little bit of a tangent before we get there and let the awesome. listeners know prior to us scheduling, we talked about what the format of this episode would be mm -hmm. and whether we should be addressing the, the broader topic of, you use the term disability in the martial arts, if I remember yeah. correctly, I don't, I don't want to misrepresent. Um, or should we be talking about your story and finding ways to thread that through? And at the end, we, you, you were, you were pretty firm that your story is your story and you didn't want to speak for anyone else, mm. but you do have a, an opportunity here to speak to quite a few martial arts instructors and school owners who may have very little experience working with folks who have disabilities. And not only do you have the, the knowledge and the understanding of, of where you're at, of your story, but you have the contrast of training before and after. Granted, there's some years in between, but I think that you're a great person to at least open the subject to start a conversation for quite a number of folks. So I, I appreciate your willingness to do that. Now I'll pull back my tangent and get back to asking you the question that I was starting to ask. When you had that first conversation with the instructor and explained what was going on with you, how did you express that? And what, what was that conversation like? And how might it have gone wrong? You obviously stuck around. What would have made you not stick around? Um, so uh, the reason I've stuck around um, is because the uh, I the style um, Shaolin Kempo I have has a lot of variety in it, and that means that if there's particular thing because I have flare ups and there's days when I I'm limping into the dojo and there's days when I'm running into the dojo my my it can vary quite significantly and it's important. It, what made me stick around was on my bad days, when I was at my worst, there was always still something I could work on, always something I could still do. And there wasn't an expectation on me that I must perform these set of movements today in class. Um, instead, I could alter it or change it or just do something different that I could do that, was that would not cause me pain but would still help me achieve my outcomes. Um, and so approaching, uh, when I talk to my senseis, uh, sensei Gary, he, he's a very uh, open guy. He's a very friendly guy. He's a very accommodating guy. And he sees martial arts in the way that I see martial arts, that martial arts isn't um, just for one type of person. It's martial arts can be for everybody. And, it, and it, it's his role as an instructor to... Um, almost make the martial art fit the person rather than the person fit the martial art. There's kind of a bit of give and take both ways with that, I think. But um, I think too many people are um, put off maybe starting martial arts because they 
they don't see people like me doing martial arts. They see Bruce Lee or um, Donnie Yen or all these really hyper fit, super athletic people doing martial arts, whether that's on TV or, or in films or even if they read about them. Um, everyone is athletic and they're not normal in, you know, inverted commas. Um, but they're also even less so there's, they're not disabled. Um, I don't know about you, but do you know many disabled veteran martial artists or many people that suffer with maybe uh, mental uh, disabilities or I, I know they're out there, but they're just, you, you don't see them. Right. And I think, I think part of, uh, Part of the reason I wanted to talk is because I wanted people to know that there are people like me and I think there are people out there, more of us out there than, than maybe are represented. But also there's many more people I think would benefit from martial arts that are being put off because um, maybe there's just not the awareness that, that you know, things can, things can be tweaked. Um, yes. And you can, you can still achieve a high level without with some um with some uh modifications to, to the way you train you talked you, you just got into a whole bunch of stuff so let, let me sorry let me re no no please this is this is great so let me respond to a couple things there i do know some folks with physical and mental challenges that participate in martial arts that participate at a level higher than the majority of people who are quote unquote able-bodied. Yeah. You know, the, the folks that we would, we would think of as your average human beings, but as a percentage, they certainly represent a smaller portion of the population of martial artists. Now I can't say, do they represent in equal larger or smaller percentage as it relates to the overall population? I don't know because unfortunately, Individuals that have physical or mental challenges don't tend to be put out in front, no. as you have said. And that creates, whether accurately or not, a perception that they are less common. Martial arts is already not terribly common in the United States. We're talking about somewhere around three and a half, three percent of the overall population. And so when you talk about a small percentage of a small percentage, mm. it becomes really hard to see. And the beauty of you coming on the show today is that you're going to reach a lot of people, whereas most people, their exposure to those in the martial arts is limited to the folks in their own school. Yeah. Now, you might have a huge school, and statistically, from the surveying we've done, a huge school is, is over 200 people. There are very few schools that even crest 100 people. So when you consider that, a couple percentage points of that, I mean, you might be talking about one person, maybe. So that doesn't leave a lot of opportunity for the instructor and the class overall to know how to support that person. Mm -hmm. And the more that we have that support in place, the more we can see folks thrive. And the other thing I wanted to respond to was what you're talking about with good days and bad days, with the not only the need, but now the ability to make some modifications to what you're training, how you're training, that should be something that is in place in every school regardless. Because, you know, like right now, I'm dealing with a wrist thing. And unfortunately, last week, I was out for what I knew was going to be the last motorcycle ride of the year. I made a poor decision. The bike went down, not at high speed, but it ended up injuring my wrist. Now, that's not anything permanent, but I need to modify my training because of that wrist injury. And if you are at a school that doesn't allow that, that doesn't allow modification, and it's either you're at 100% or you're not there at all, you're probably not there very long because we all end up with bumps and bruises and, and injuries in and out of training. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. All that being said, the sensei's conversation with you, 
we'll bring it back to that. Mm -hmm. If we have someone listening who is an instructor, who does have someone approach them and to say, you know, I have these challenges or maybe someone I I represent, perhaps a a child or, or their guardian for someone who has some challenges. What, what should that conversation look like? What should they be saying? What should they be asking? I think it's really important to understand about the challenge itself, not just know the name, but actually how it affects them on a day-to-day basis and how it's going to affect them going forward. Um, but it's also important to know, and this is should be a question that they ask everyone anyway, is, you know, what are you wanting to get out of this? Why are you coming here today? Uh, I mean, if you're sitting in, in, a, in an office or whatever with a, with a sensei um, looking to maybe join up, then you've already taken action. Um, so they obviously want to be there. So you, you need to make sure that um, they know what they're getting themselves in for um, as to what's be expected of them. But also, you know, know that ultimately you're there to help them grow. Um, you're there to help them learn. And you want to be respectful of the fact that they may have limitations. And, and then you can di- discuss together as a team um, and less as a, you know, as a, I'm the sensei, you're the student, do as I say, more of a, a collaborative approach to your training to say, okay, this didn't work today. Let's see how we can modify it and, and, and make it work for you better. Um, and that's just an ongoing process. And so I think in that initial kind of contact, you just really need to understand um, understand the person and understand their challenges um, and just ask lots. And that will depend on the challenges, what, what questions you ask, but you just ask lots of questions. Um, most people will be happy to answer them um, because it's nice when, when, you're, when you're living with a condition that most people haven't heard of, um, to have someone ask questions about your condition and, and genuinely want to know more about it it's very, um, it's very pleasing and it's very, um, I'm not sure what the right word is, but, um, it's, it's, it's a positive experience that you just want to kind of want to give them all the information they can, because those opportunities don't present themselves as often as they should. Mm. Um, Completely agree. All right. Let's bring it back. Let's talk about you, your story, your journey. Mm -hmm. And now you can pick this from, from, you know, your, your first stint in the martial arts, maybe your second stint, your current endeavors in the martial arts, or perhaps the time in between, because as you and I have both agreed, you were still a martial artist. If you were to pull your best story, your best martial arts story from within the grander story that is your life, what would that be? Um, well, it's not a Bill Wallace story. I'll put that out there. Everyone, everyone has a Bill Wally story, but me. They seem to, don't uh, they? Yeah, they do. Uh, maybe one day that'll change. Um, so I have kind of, well, it's kind of a two-part story um, that I, I was going to share with you guys. Um, it doesn't paint me necessarily in the best light in the first instance, but I think it's a good teaching opportunity that um, other people may have experienced similar things. So, um so back when I was um, in doing Shotokan karate as a as a as a twelve year old, um, I entered a uh, tournament, and we did probably three or four tournaments a year. I'm not quite sure. Um, we did a lot of them though. Um, so I was. This is towards the end of kind of my Shotokan career. Um, we. I was. I was in a. I was. I was doing sparring now for some reason and this was a tournament we went to every year but for some reason this particular year they were running about two hours behind mm. so they were way way behind and it felt like we were there all day so when it come for our division and our age group to to do our sparring they says look we normally do round robin but we're gonna have to cut it everyone only gets five fights um because there was probably eight or nine of us in the group we haven't got time. Oh, and no longer is it the first to uh, three, four points or uh, um, it, then it's um, you just, just f- first point, first four points. So like, um, the way we scored it back then was, you know, if it was just a good, 
good strike or just contact, it was like half a point. But if it was a good controlled strike, maybe to the side of the head or something, then, then it was a full. Um, so they kind of uh, scored the points like that. Um, and back then, we never wore headgear and stuff. You know, it was just a bit of foam on the back of a mitt. So, uh, so it really had to be controlled um, when you were hitting each other in the head as a 12-year-old. Those were the days. Um, <laughs> so we, we, was, we were sparring and um, we, uh, we, we did okay. And it turns out that um, there was, uh, sorry, we had three fights each. And it turned out that the five of us all had won two and lost one. But obviously they only could advance four to the next, to the next stages, you know, bronze place a fight and then a silver and gold medal fight. Um, and I was the one that got left down. Um, now looking back, it was probably because I had more points scored on me. We all won the same amount of fights. So we all scored the same amount of points. Um, so, and I got very angry about that even more so when I realized that the people I beat were the people who got gold and silver. Um, and I, I, I beat them both, you know, leading up to that. So, as a 12 year old, I got very upset about that and very angry. And I carried that around with me, like until about two years ago. Um, that's always been something that aggr- that annoyed me, um, that I, I should have won that, that, that tournament, that medal, um, because I was better than those. I beat them. Um, so fast forward to maybe, I want to say two years ago, I was, uh, maybe a, first degree brown or second degree brown belt um, in Campo. Um, and I was going into a tournament and the previous two tournaments, I took first place in sparring. So this was my third tournament with them total. Um, and first for sparring, because we only spar. In our school, we do to- tournaments a year. The, the, the um, tournament is just for our school. We have uh, kind of four dojos in the area. So we're a pretty big school pretty big school um big enough to have our own tournament um and we only do sparring every other tournament uh, because of all the other events we have Mm -hmm. um so i was going in undefeated looking for my third straight gold medal um in sparring and it happens that this this year there was this new guy come he just signed up a few weeks before he had no belt on because he hadn't tested yet but no one knew who he was because because we I, we were at a different different location that we'd never met before. No one knew who he was, but he was there. He was a legitimate student, um, and he was. I'm five foot seven. He must have been about six foot four. Cool. Um, yeah, there's a big height difference. Uh, his reach just felt like forever, um, and he turns out that he had multiple black belts. He did. Um, all kinds of, of um, martial arts before that, which is why I didn't have a belt yet. He, um, so he was sparring and he was just wiping the floor with everyone because he, he'd done American sports fighting karate. And that was what he was good at. That was his bread and butter. Um, and in Kempo, we tend not to kick much. And we're not the best kick, you know, we're not Taekwondo practitioners. We don't, we don't, we can kick high, but we, don't usually practice it that much. So when it comes to sparring, we generally spar in a Kempo way, not in a Taekwondo way. And he was doing Taekwondo type kicks and he, he was just beating everybody. So it got to the final and it was just me and him. And he was the only person in my way of getting this third gold medal and keeping my undefeated record. And I lost um very badly and i got angry again i got that same feeling than when i felt that i felt back when i was a kid and the next event was um my forms i went out to do my form and i completely screwed it up my head was all over the place because i was still um annoyed and angry and frustrated from the previous event and I completely screwed up my form, didn't even place. And I thought I knew something was wrong in my head. So I I just disappeared. My next event was a weapons event. And I had a bit of time. I had quite a bit of time 
to an event. So I just disappeared. I just went and found a quiet corner somewhere and just sat on my own. So I, I, I sat there um, thinking about what just happened and thinking, I've got to get my head straight for, for the weapons. I've got to do well in the weapons. And um, I started thinking about this was just exactly how I felt when I was a, when I was a kid and I lost that, that sparring tournament. And I was thinking, why am I feeling like this? This isn't like me. I've went in all my other events. I have lost before. I have performed badly before. And at no point have I got angry. I've just accepted it. I didn't do, maybe I didn't do my best or maybe I didn't train hard enough. I just, it was like water off a duck's back and I just moved on, kept going forward. I never got angry and frustrated. I always tried to stay calm and humble. Um, these two particular occasions it wasn't the case and it was because it was sparring there was something about it that just that just got to me and so I sat and I thought about it longer and thought well this can't be a coincidence and I'm feeling the same way as I felt felt back then and I started thinking about back to then and and then I started thinking about things that my dad had told me back then which I now was starting to appreciate. Um, he, he always had uh, two two things to say to me. He says, "Doesn't matter how good you are, there's always someone bigger, better, and stronger than you." Um, and the other thing he always told me was, "You always leave your ego at the door." Um, and I'd done neither of those, and so now I started getting upset for a completely different reason, because I was acting out of character, and I had taken my ego into the match, and. Really, I probably would have done a lot better if I hadn't. Um, and it took me a while of sitting there and stewing on my own to, to kind of realize this. But um, that was kind of a, a, a changing point for me, um, not just kind of in tournament practice, but also kind of in my whole martial arts career, because um, it made me realize that even as calm as I normally am and as uh, determined as I normally am, even I still have things to work on. And even something as, as obvious as not letting your ego get the better of you when you're sparring um, is something that we can all fall foul to. And I managed to, I managed to clear my thoughts and clear my head. And I come to this realization that that was what was the problem was, is that I didn't leave my ego at the door. I took it in the match with me. Um, and after that, I just went outside and I just started practicing my weapons form, uh, getting ready for my tournament. And just having that time alone and coming to that realization just helped tremendously. It, just, it was just like someone flicked a switch. And I went into, that, I went into the, my event and I performed that weapons form, the best I have ever performed that weapons form. I have never even come close to it since. Um, and that just reinforced this, the fact that it, I needed to stay calm and I needed not to take, you know, to carry that burden with me. And looking back um, at those, you know, that event that had happened 20 years ago, um, I'd been carrying that all my life. And it, it took another occurrence that incidents to, to teach me that, you know, there was some, that there was, you know, I wasn't approaching it the right way. And actually I needed to, needed to change something. Hmm. And thankfully it's never been an issue since. So, does that, I mean, I mean, it's, it's not a, a particular, uh, particularly uh, fancy story. It's not a, a humorous story, but I think it's a story that other people can relate to because I've seen instances where people have done the same thing since then. I've, I've now I've kind of got this eye for it that, and, um, it, I think it's something that people suffer with and you don't always realize that you're doing it. Absolutely. You know, it's really easy for us to talk about these, these values, these mindsets of, you know, focusing on yourself and letting things go. And it's really easy to say those words. It's really easy to agree with those concepts. But if you don't have the opportunity to practice them, because they're not, I would argue they're not natural. No, Instinctively, I, I would agree. we're self-protective. Absolutely. We're out for our, you know, we, there's an element of selfishness that I think has to exist for a species to continue on. 
And here we are, we talk about incidents, stories, like what you're sharing with us today, where in both of those examples, you had something to point at to say, this is not right. This is not fair. I have been wronged. And it's really difficult to let things go, to let it roll off your back when you believe you've done your best and circumstances beyond your control negatively affected the outcome. It is unfair, is what many of us would say. Mm. So to have that opportunity to practice that, to practice saying, you know what? Yeah, it's unfair, but I just have to move on. Otherwise, as you expressed, it can continue to affect other things. And there's some value in working on that. Now, I'm not certainly not saying this from any kind of ivory tower. The last couple times that I've competed, I felt things went against me in a way that I was not thrilled about. And I continue to practice, excuse me, in and outside of martial arts, in and outside of competition, this notion that sometimes it's not going to go my way. It's not easy. It is definitely not easy. And I, I agree. It is almost against human nature. Um, and that's, um, yeah, that's, that's very difficult. And it's not, it's something that you can't just do. It's something you have to fail at first before you can, before you can actually learn and, and move on and actually do it. You can't just turn around and say, oh, well, this is the way I'm going to act from now on. This is the way I'm going to approach life. You've got to fail. Otherwise, you're never going to actually truly understand what you're trying to achieve and what, you're tr- what, what, what it is that you actually need to overcome. So you totally. have to fail. Failure is part of the process. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Human beings learn more by making mistakes than we do by succeeding. Absolutely. And that's Success. How I all, all lessons. Success teaches you one path, right? It teaches you one way that things can work, but failures allow you to cross off a way that didn't work. And you you narrow up the options that are worth trying. I think it's great. If you could train with anyone, anywhere in the world, anywhere in time, you've probably heard this question before on the show. Oh, yes. (laughs) Who would you want to train with? Um, so aside from the obvious, right, I know Bruce Lee, right, but everyone says that, and uh, yeah, he's on the list. I, I can't give you any other reason that anyone else hasn't explained to you in the past, you know, few episodes of the podcast. But I think right now, the person I'd like most to train with would probably be Dan in Sotana, in a Santo, in Santo, Santo, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, he's a He's a great martial artist um, and he's, he's someone that, it, um, that is, I've always heard positive things about and that makes me want to be around him. I've yes. never heard anyone say anything negative about him ever. There's not one story I've, I've seen or read. Um, so him, I mean, uh, to, I mean, the honest answer is I'd want to train with anybody. I don't, I don't even, I don't care what rank you are. Um, I learned some of my, some of the best things from white belts. Um, well, but white belts can teach you more than a, than training alongside a fellow black belt can. Um, so I, I mean, the honest answer is I want to train with everybody, but, mm. uh, but I think as far as putting a name on it, I think him, uh, and, and also I would put alongside that, um, um, Hanshi Bruce Jutnik as well. Hmm. Hanshi Jutnik is, yeah. is great. I uh, just saw a, a number of friends, several folks who have been on the show, in fact, were in Reno, Nevada at his event this past weekend. And, and my, 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 head, my, my headmaster was there as well. Oh, awesome. awesome. He trains yeah. alongside him sometimes. And, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, no, he's a, he's a character from, from what I've, I've seen and read. Oh, uh, absolutely. I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to learn more about his style of Kempo as well. Have you heard the episodes that he's been on? Oh yes, I went back and uh, where I went back and listened to those. Yeah, absolutely. And for folks listening, he's been on twice. The first time, did our standard you know conversation with him, but then it was his idea, and we actually videoed this one. He talked to Grandmaster Bill Wallace at an event last year 
and I got the privilege to film that. And so that's available as audio in your feed. I, I want to say it's like 180 something. Uh, and then and we'll, we'll, we'll link these in the show notes, uh, but it's also available in video on YouTube. Tons of fun watching two guys who have a, a library of stories. Yeah, they have a lot of going stories back and though. forth, and and two folks with absolutely phenomenal memories. When you look at your time as a martial artist, you know if you were to take a snapshot of who you are as a martial artist right now, who had the biggest contribution to that persona? Um. I, I think obviously my sensei has had a big impact on kind of my training and how I, um, how I work. But I think aside from him, it's it's been my father. My father's been probably the biggest influence on my martial arts, mostly because although he didn't, he spent some time, but he didn't really teach me how to punch and kick and do any kind of moves or techniques. He taught me. Um, he taught me the values. He taught me, like uh, going back to the t two things he always told me. Uh, you know, there's always leave your ego at the door, and there's always someone bigger, better, stronger, faster. And those apply to it, not just martial arts, but every walk of life. Anything you try and do in life, there's always going to be someone better. And he always told me, find that person who's better than you, and that's who you'll learn the most from. Go and work with them. Don't try and be the best person in the room. Um, try and try and um, find that best person and then learn from them. Um, and that's kind of what I do now. And, and that's how I've always approached everything in life. Um, he also helped me obviously with things like confidence and discipline and um, my work ethic and all of that comes from him. Um, and that is all fed into my martial arts. And a part of that is probably who he is. And part of that is because he trained in martial arts as well. Um, and part of that is because we used to sit down and watch Bruce Lee movies when I was far too young to be watching Bruce Lee movies. Um, and uh, yeah, he, I think those have had more impact on my martial arts than anything else. Mm. You know, uh, certainly not an uncommon answer here on the show. You know, the, the influence of the parents on who we are, not just as people, but as martial artists. And you mentioned at the top of the show that your father had trained in Shotokan. Mm -hmm. But we've had plenty of folks on the show who will still mention one or both of their parents as their major martial arts influence, even if they didn't train. And quite often, it's the support that they received, the transportation, the financial support to do martial arts. But then sometimes that answer is, is maybe a little less positive. You know, it's the negative influence of the parents that showed them what a good family, quote unquote, family could look like that they found in the martial arts. So I continue to find it fascinating that, you know, we, we think about your instructor typically being the one, you know, and you mentioned your current instructor as being your, your first primary influence, but you know, I, I don't know that I'll ever wrap my brain around how deeply someone outside the martial arts can influence what we do in the martial arts. I just I find it I find it neat. I'm just pointing that out to myself as much as anyone else. Okay. We've talked about Bruce Lee a couple times today, and you mentioned that you watched some of his movies when you were maybe a bit too young to have done so. What's your favorite one? Um uh... Probably Enter the Dragon. Mm. Yeah, I like them all, but yeah, probably Enter the Dragon. I was, I was, um, I actually just got back from a trip to China, which was not martial arts related, and and obviously there was there was Bruce Lee movies on the plane ride over, so um, that was quite interesting. It's been a while since I've uh, since I've seen some of the older ones, but yeah, mm. I actually watched a really interesting documentary about. Um, the way of the dragon um and there was a documentary about them visiting all the old filming locations and seeing how much they've changed on all these famous fight scenes of his um so that was that was interesting 
He continues to be such a strong influence. And you've probably listened to many of the listeners have probably listened to the episode that I did with Mr. Matthew Polly. And I remember the episode number on that one, 305. And do you know why I remember that one? Because every couple days I have to go on YouTube and delete some horrendous, hateful, just vitriolic comments. He is the most famous martial artist and still the most polarizing figure. Yes. You can't say anything about Bruce Lee without someone thinking you are wrong. Doesn't matter what kind of evidence you have. Doesn't matter how innocuous it is. You could say, on this date, Bruce ate a ham sandwich. That is and there, true. And there would that be people true. tearing you down saying, it was a turkey sandwich you X would have deleted. <laughs> yeah, that, that is true of everyone, though, that has changed their... Um, has changed their sport or changed the, the society in some way. I mean, you you pick a popular figure that has that has made an actual, contribute, meaningful um, change in in our culture, and you can say the same thing about them. I mean, some of the most genius people on this planet have got people that say extremely negative things about them. Mm. The next one that comes to mind, and certainly not a martial arts figure, is Michael Jordan. And if anyone out there is even a casual basketball fan, you've probably seen some pretty deep arguments about Michael Jordan, comparing Michael Jordan to other people, you know, as a contemporary people comparing him to LeBron James. And, yeah. and you know, I don't know that you, you can help something take a big step forward without becoming a polarizing figure. As you've just said, it's an interesting idea. Yeah. I don't, I, I honestly believe that's not possible. But, um, well, that, you, you have to to for, to move things forward. You have to push people outside of their comfort zone, right? And you have to you have to push those boundaries. And people like being comfortable; they don't like being <laughs> uncomfortable. Um, so there are going to be people that are open to that um, a new way of thinking or a new way of doing something. And there are going to be people that just want to hate it. They just want things to stay they stay the way they want. Um, because they don't like change and I love change. Change is my favorite thing. Change is one of the very few things in life that is guaranteed. Um, mm. and, and you can't have growth without it. I can't have growth without change, which is why I embrace it because I always want to, you know, as a martial artist and a person, I always want to try and better myself day on day on day. And I can't do that without change. Mm. If things stay the same then. And there's no growth. Totally. Outside of Bruce Lee, you have any other martial arts movies or actors that really resonate for you? Oh, all of them. Oh, uh, okay. That's a, them. that is a broad <laughs> realization. <laughs> uh, I like, I like watching everyone um, purely because I, I like to see how different people move differently. And that, that I find extremely intriguing. Um, you know, you put, mm, uh, Michael Jai White next to Donnie Yen, next to Jackie Chan. They're all very different and they all move in a different way. Um, and neither of them move like I move. So I'm interested by them. If, if, if I found someone that moved exactly like me, which I think is extremely doubtful, um, then maybe I wouldn't be so interested. But I'm interested because they're different. Um, and there's always something to learn from everyone, right? Uh, you know, going back to martial arts, philosophers, um, Shoshin, beginner's mindset, um, learn something from anyone. Yeah. So I, I, lo I love them all. Good. Even the bad movies. Like, <laughs> yeah. Some have even said that the bad movies are the better movies. Yeah, they are. <laughs> because without they the are. martial arts, there's no value there. So you just <laughs> no, you don't feel bad skipping ahead. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the Karate Kid, I know we probably share, we're of similar age. So we, we kind of share this in common, but um, you know, the karate kid movie is probably my favorite martial arts film of all time. Phenomenal um, movie. Yeah. And, and it goes back to, you know, when that came out and or when it was popular, I mean, it was kind of come out around the time, probably a little before I was old enough to watch it. I can't quite remember the year, but um, you know, I, watching that, growing up as a child who was being bullied i could very much relate to daniel and um and then i you know i studied martial arts so then i just saw all these parallels and it that's why it became 
you know, my favorite film because, you know, it's in my mind as a, as a young child, I was Daniel LaRusso, you know, and I always wanted to win the tournament at the end. Maybe, maybe actually, I've just thought about this. Maybe that's going back to the, the story I told earlier. Maybe that's why I wanted to win so much. Mm. This is, this is like, this is like free therapy. It is. This is great. It is. <laughs> You're not the first to say that. <laughs> I've just made that connection now. I've never thought about it before, but maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. I always wanted to beat Johnny in the final. And maybe that, maybe that was why. Hmm. Well, you still have the chance. I still, <laughs> yeah. I kind of retired from competing, but I not judge, but, uh, but that's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, but, you know, season two of Cobra Kai is, is kind of coming out soonish, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think we're into 2019 for it, but it, you know, yeah. well, it did that's get the green light. And... Yeah. Well, they, they've already started filming. So. Right. Right. Talk, talk about a out of left field success. Yeah, I, know. I think I went through the entire season in two days, three days. I got into episode two or three and went... Oh, I need to clear my schedule. <laughs> it's the beauty of, of doing what I do is I get to call that work. Well, I'm going to need to do this because... Um, it's research for a future project. We'll, yeah, we'll need to write something at Marshall Journal or you know, there'll be a podcast episode about it. I, I, need to, I need to watch Cobra Kai right now. And that both of those things were true, right? Yes, yes they did happen. Those did happen. There you That's go then. Nice. So it was work. It was. Let's talk about the future. We spent a lot talking about the past. What do you see in your future as a martial artist? Um, that's a good question. I've, it's something I don't give a lot of thought about um, because I've always, when I've tried to plan stuff in the future and, and say, I want to get here, it just doesn't happen, you know, for one reason or another. Um, I, so I do... I do obviously set goals and targets, otherwise I'd never get anything done. So um, right now I'm just working as hard as I can um, to, to work towards my second degree, but um, that's a little while off, I'm sure. Um, um, I've not been a black belt for that long and I've not really been doing Kempo for that long. Um, but yeah, so that's my, that's my, uh, that's my kind of immediate goal. I, beyond that, I, I've not concentrated on it. I've not thought about it, to be honest. Um, I'm kind of in a good place right now. Um, you know, day to day, I'm I'm a stay-at-home dad to my six-year-old and four-year-old, um, and I, my condition is is under control. I train just the amount of times a week, and I don't train too much that makes my disease worse because that has happened before. Um, I can overtrain and and. Re- uh, recovery is very important to my disease, so um, getting that balance between training and recovery uh, has been a has been a, a challenge. But I've kind of got it down now, so you know, every th- I kind of just want to keep things the same while trying to push a little bit further with my knowledge. And part of my disease is that that is degenerative. There is no cure for my disease, and any damage that happens to my bones, um, when so what will happen is over time is some of my bones may fuse together in my spine. Um, the old name for this used to be called bamboo spine because you, uh, you know, you your spine used to look like a piece of bamboo. It was just one straight rod. It didn't move at all because all the vertebrae had fused together. Now we've got much better treatments these days, medications, and now I'm training all the time. That's probably never going to happen to me. Um, but if there are any kind of bone growth or damage to them as, as then it's not reversible at all. So this is a degenerative disease. So as far as my, physical performance goes i am probably as going to be as good as i am going to be but i'm just going to keep training to maintain what i've got and um i'm very much interested in increasing my knowledge because as i get older and possibly more disabled my knowledge is is something i can still work on even if i can't physically get any better as a martial artist and so those, those are my goals those are great goals love it as well as trying to be a better father, you know, and martial art, being a stay-at-home dad, martial arts has helped me a lot. Um, when I started, there has been a significant difference between um, when I first became a stay-at-home dad before martial arts and after. 
Um, I'm much more patient. I'm much calmer. I, um, I, I am. I am a better father because of it. Because I've I've now got this practice. Um, and they're the reason I. St one of the reasons. The main reason I started martial arts. I mean, I mentioned earlier that uh, I started martial arts because I wanted friends and uh, I needed to lose weight and exercise. But the, the main reason really was the fact that I was at home with my kids and I found that my son was copying everything I did, and. I realized that some of those things I didn't want him to do. And it's very hard to say, no, you can't do that when you're doing some, when you're doing it yourself. Children don't understand that. Um, and it made me take a look at myself and think I need to, I need to lead by example. So if this, these are the values and virtues I want to instill on my kids. And this is the way I want them to lead their life in a positive, healthy way Then I need to be doing the same. And that was, that was what really, you know, kind of clicked and got me, got me really pushed me over the edge to, to train and train again. Um, and I've completely changed my lifestyle around, you know, the way I eat, the way I exercise, the way I, I treat my body. Uh, and that is now paying dividends because I can now see those, um, those kind of being reflected in my children. And, and that's what I wanted. And that's what I want to keep on doing that I'm constantly improving myself to show them that they could and should do the same. Wonderful, wonderful things to talk about, to think about. And certainly a mindset that I wish we could all choose, you know, this notion of just trying to get better where you can, accepting where you are, but you know, being open to that growth, that change that we've talked about and recognizing that, you know, nothing is, is permanent. If people want to get a hold of you, find you online, anything like that, where would they do so? Um, I'm mostly on Twitter these days. Um, my handle is endless tracks, E N D L E S S T R X. Um, I actually have, endlesstracks.com, which was a blog I used to blog about uh, my condition and dealing and manage it, but it's not an active blog, so probably don't go there unless you think you've got the disease. Um, I, but you can also find me at rickywhite.net. I'm around around there, and, and that has all the different things I do. I wear many, many hats in life. Um, martial arts and and, um, and being a dad are just two of the, two, two of the many things I do, so um, you can get me there. Those are the two main places. Awesome. And of course, folks, as most of you know, we will link all of that over on our show notes pages, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. This is episode 348. We don't normally know the episode number when we go live, but I had this one plugged in. Made sure I kept the spot. I appreciate your time here. This has been a lot of fun. Great conversation. I'm, I'm pretty sure you and I could chat most of the day. But Absolutely. Let's wind it down because I don't think listeners are going to be so keen if we suddenly veer into six hour episodes, which is probably where our conversation would tail off. What parting words would you leave everyone with today? I think uh, regardless of whether you're a student or you're an instructor, or maybe you're just listening to this and you've never done martial arts before somebody, everybody is fighting something, whether they're fighting a, a chronic illness, a, a disability, whether they've just got divorced or they've um, just lost someone dear to them, everyone has a fight they're going through. And that you won't ever understand somebody until you understand what they're fighting for or against. And if you want to help them make an impact in their life, you need to, you need to get to know the person by understanding what they're fighting for. Um, and if you're an instructor, find out what your student's fighting right now. Um, and, and then you'll be able to um, help them uh, through martial arts deal with whatever they're fighting for. And if you've never done martial arts before, well, maybe martial arts will help you get through what you're fighting for. But everyone's got something. We all deal with our own physical challenges. But it seems to me that folks who have persistent physical challenges do a much better job of wrapping their head around them, of being able to integrate those challenges into their lives. And it's that lesson that I took from Senpai White today that I think is most important, at least for me, the idea that, yeah, 
I'm going to have things feel bad. I'm going to have things that don't work right in my body. And as I get older, it's only going to get worse. But that doesn't mean I stop training. It doesn't mean that it has to change my mindset. So I thank you, Senpai White, for coming on the show today, sharing your story, and helping, if no one else, to inspire me. You can check out show notes with photos and links to everything we talked about today, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Don't forget, you can shop our products at whistlekick.com and use the code PODCAST15 to save 15%. If you want to get to me directly, that's jeremy at whistlekick.com, or you can find us on social media at Whistlekick, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Thanks for your time today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.